Question 1. Which of the following is a distinguishing feature of oppositional defiant disorder? Is it A, frequent physical aggression, B, severe repeated acts of aggression, C, an inability to take responsibility for mistakes, or D, an enduring pattern of compliant behavior? The correct answer is A, an inability to take responsibility for mistakes. This choice accurately reflects key characteristics of ODD. Children with ODD often struggle to acknowledge their own errors and tend to place the blame on others instead. This behavior contributes to the negative, defiant pattern characteristic of the disorder. Now let's examine why the other options are incorrect. A, frequent physical aggression. You know, this choice describes a characteristic more commonly associated with conduct disorder rather than ODD. While children with ODD may display hostility and defiance, they typically do not engage in severe physical aggression. And option B, severe repeated acts of aggression. Again, this option aligns more closely with conduct disorder rather than ODD. Conduct disorder involves more extreme and persistent aggressions towards others, including physical harm, whereas ODD primarily manifests as noncompliance and defiance towards authority figures. And then option D, an enduring pattern of compliant behavior. This option is the opposite of defining feature of ODD. Children with ODD typically exhibit a persistent pattern of negativistic and defiant behavior rather than compliance with rules and authority figures. Question two, compared to conduct disorder, children with oppositional defiant disorder are more likely to do A, show compliance with authority figures, B, engage in severe, repeated acts of aggression, C, experience difficulties in peer relationships, or D, display an absence of negativistic behaviors. The correct answer is C, experience difficulty in peer relationships. Let's go over the incorrect answers. Option A, show compliance with authority figures. You know, this choice is not characteristic of ODD. In fact, children with ODD often exhibit defiance and resistance towards authority figures, which distinguishes them from those with conduct disorder. And then option B, engage in severe repeated acts of aggression. While aggression can be present in both ODD and conduct disorder, the severity and the persistence of aggression are typically more pronounced in conduct disorder. ODD is primarily characterized by non-compliance, defiance, and difficulty in interpersonal relationships rather than severe repeated acts of aggression. And then option D, display an absence of negativistic behaviors. This option contradicts the defining features of ODD which involves negativistic, hostile, and defiant behaviors toward authority figures. Children with ODD commonly exhibit these behaviors, setting them apart from those with conduct disorder. Question 3. What distinguishes ODD from conduct disorder? A. Inability to take responsibility for mistakes. B. Frequent arguments with adults. C. Severe repeated acts of aggression. Or D, absence of significant violations of others' rights. The correct answer is D, absence of significant violations of others' rights. Unlike conduct disorder, which involves severe repeated violations of others' rights, ODD typically does not include such extreme behaviors. Instead, ODD is characterized by persistent patterns of negativistic, hostile, and defiant behaviors in the absence of significant rights violations. Let's go over the ones that were incorrect. A, inability to take responsibility for mistakes. While this behavior is characteristic of ODD, it is not a distinguishing feature between ODD and conduct disorder. Both disorders may actually involve difficulties in taking responsibility for one's actions, but this behavior alone does not differentiate between the two. And then option B, frequent arguments with adults. You know, while arguments with authority figures are common in ODD, they can occur in conduct disorder as well. So then it's not a distinguishing factor between the two. And of C, severe repeated acts of aggression. 
This option is more characteristic of conduct disorder than ODD. Conduct disorder often involves more severe, persistent aggression, including physical harm to others, whereas ODD typically manifests as non-compliance and defiance rather than severe aggression. Question four, which behavior is characteristic of ODD? A, excessive compliance with rules. B, difficulty in peer relationships. C, severe repeated acts of aggression. Or D, frequent adherence to authority figures' instructions. The correct answer is B, difficulty in peer relationships. These children have difficulty maintaining peer relationships for many reasons, such as having difficulty with conflict and aggression, making it difficult to maintain a positive relationship with others. They also can lack empathy with other children and are insensitive or hurtful in their interactions with their peer. They have poor social skills. They have negative, they can be susceptible to negative peer influences and gravitate towards peers that might also be engaging in defiant or aggressive behavior. Also, they can have rejection to sensitivity or criticism from their peers. And of course, they are, have difficulty with authority figures. Now, let's go over the incorrect answers. Option A, excessive compliance with rules and regulations. Uh, this behavior is not characteristic of ODD. In fact, children with ODD typically exhibit defiance and resistance toward rules and authority figures rather than excessive compliance. And then C, severe repeated acts of, acts of aggression. While aggression can be present in both ODD and conduct disorder, it's more commonly associated with conduct disorder. ODD primarily manifests as a non-compliance, defiance, and difficulty in interpersonal relationships rather than severe acts of aggression. And then option D, frequent adherence to authority figures? Uh, no, this completely contradicts the defining characteristics of ODD. In fact, ODD children are often defiant and resistant towards authority figures. They'll often challenge or disobey rather than adhere to instructions. Question five. According to the DSM-5, how many types of oppositional defiant disorders are there? A, one, B, two, C, three, or D, four? The correct answer is C, three. The DSM-5 has categorized oppositional defiant disorder into three types, angry, irritable mood, argumentative or defiant behavior, and vindictiveness. These types reflect different patterns of behavior that children with oppositional defiant disorder may exhibit. Question six, which of the following is not a symptom of the angry, irritable type of oppositional defiant disorder? A, easily annoyed, B, argumentative behavior, C, frequent temper loss, or D, chronic feelings of irritability? The correct answer is B, argumentative behavior. Now, when we talk about the angry, irritable type of oppositional defiant disorder, we're focusing on children who frequently exhibit irritability, anger, and a tendency to lose their temper. These children often find themselves in a state of chronic irritability where even small annoyances can set them off. So in essence, the hallmark feature here are irritability, temper loss, and generally cranky disposition. Let's go over the uh, options of why they're incorrect. Option A, easily annoyed. This is absolutely a hallmark symptom of angry, irritable type. These children often struggle to regulate their emotions and may have frequent outbursts of temper. Option D, chronic feeling of irritability. Uh, this is essentially the defining feature of angry, irritable type. These children often experience a persistent underlying feeling of irritability, which colors much of the behavior and interaction. So what made option B incorrect? Option B was argumentative behavior. You know, while argument behavior is certainly a feature of ODD, it's more of a characteristic of argumentative defiant type rather than angry irritable type. Children with angry irritable subtype are more prone to explosive outbursts of anger and irritability rather than engaging in prolonged arguments with authority figures. Question seven, how many symptoms 
from the three types of oppositional defiant disorder are required for diagnosing according to the DSM-5? Is it A-2, B-3, C-4, or D-5? The correct answer is C-4. Now, when it comes to diagnosing ODD, according to the DSM-5, Clinicians must look for patterns of symptoms across three types, the angry, irritable mood, the argumentative defiant behavior, and vindictiveness. For diagnosing ODD, a child needs to display a consistent pattern of at least four symptoms from these three types over the period of at least six months. Question eight. Adolescents who are ostracized due to oppositional defiant disorder might turn to what as a way to fit in with their peers? A, academic achievement, B, alcohol and illegal substances, C, sports and extracurricular activities, and D, social activism. Correct answers, B, alcohol and illegal substances. Now, when we consider adolescents who are ostracized or socially isolated due to oppositional defiant disorder, it's not uncommon for them to seek out alternative means of fitting in with their peers. Unfortunately, adolescents who feel marginalized or rejected by their peers might seek solace in substances like alcohol or illegal drugs as a way to cope with feelings of loneliness and to gain acceptance within certain social circles, albeit temporarily. These behaviors can potentially exacerbate their difficulties and lead to further challenges in the long run. Let's go over the other options of why they're incorrect. Option A, academic achievement. You know, while academic success can certainly boost self-esteem and provide a sense of accomplishment, adolescents who are struggling with social isolation due to ODD might find it challenging to excel academically, particularly if their behavior is interfering with their school performances. And then sports and extracurricular activities, option C, you know, engaging in sports and extracurricular activities can be positive outlets for adolescents promoting teamwork, skill development, and social interaction. However, individuals with ODD may face challenges with authority figures and may find it difficult to participate in structured activities. And D, social activism is incorrect. You know, while involvement in social causes can be a positive outlet for adolescents to channel their energy and passion, it may not necessarily be the first choice for individuals with ODD who are seeking acceptance within their peer group. Social activism requires a high level of commitment and cooperation, which may be difficult for someone struggling with ODD. What distinguishes the vindictive type of oppositional defiant disorder from the other types? A, chronic feelings of irritability, B, frequent temper loss, C, spiteful actions towards others, or D, argumentative behavior. The correct answer is C, spiteful actions towards others. Now, when we consider the vindictive type of ODT, we're focusing on a specific subtype characterized by a tendency to engage in spiteful or vindictive actions towards others. This distinguishes from other types of ODD where the focus may be on irritability, argumentativeness, or defiance. Why are the other options incorrect? Well, option A, chronic feelings of irritability. While chronic irritability is a characteristic feature of the angry, irritable type of ODD, it is not specific to the vindictive type. Children with the vindictive type may exhibit irritability, but the defining feature is their tendency towards spiteful or vindictive actions. Option B, frequent temper loss. Similarly, frequent temper loss is a characteristic of the angry irritable type of ODD rather than the vindictive type. While individuals with the vindictive type may experience temper outbursts, the focus is more on their retaliatory behaviors. And then option D, argumentative behavior. Well, argumentative behavior is characteristic of argumentative defiant type of ODD, where individuals often challenge authority figures and refuse to comply with rules or requests. While children with the vindictive type may engage in arguments, their primary focus is on spiteful actions rather than verbal defiance. Question 10. What is the typical pattern of symptoms for children with ODD? A, present only at school, B, manifesting equally at home and school, C, almost invariably present in the home, but not necessarily at school, and D, present only with peers, but not with adults. 
The correct answer is C, almost invariably present in the home, but not necessarily at school. So when we examine the symptomology of ODD, it's often observed that the manifestation of the disorder are consistently present within the home environment. However, they may not always be evident in other settings such as school or with their peers. This pattern suggests that the symptoms of ODD tend to be most pronounced and consistent in familiar, intimate settings where the child feels comfortable exhibiting oppositional behaviors. And why are the other options incorrect? Well, present only at school. While children with ODD may exhibit oppositional behaviors at school, it's not accurate to say that these symptoms are exclusively confined to the school environment. ODD typically manifests across various contexts, with symptoms often being more pronounced in the home setting. Option B, manifesting equally at home and school. This option implies that the symptoms of ODD are evenly distributed between home and school environments, which is not typically the case. While some children may display oppositional behaviors in both settings, the home environment is often where these behaviors are most consistently observed. And then D, present only with peers but not adults. You know, while peer interactions may exacerbate certain behaviors in children with ODD, the disorder is not solely confined to interactions with peers. Oppositional behaviors are often directed toward authority figures and adults as well, including parents, teachers, and other caregivers. So option C is the correct answer. Almost invariably present in the home, but not necessarily at the school. This option accurately reflects the typical pattern of symptoms manifestation in children with ODD. While symptoms may vary in severity and frequency across different settings, they are commonly observed within the home environment where the child feels more comfortable expressing oppositional behaviors. This does not necessarily mean that the symptoms will never occur outside the home, but rather that they are most consistently present in this setting. Question 11. Developmentally, appropriate oppositional behavior is characterized by A, intensity considerably greater than other children, B, frequency considerably greater than other children, C, similar frequency and intensity as other children of the same mental age, or D, significantly lesser intensity compared to other children. So we are talking about developmentally appropriate oppositional behavior. We're essentially discussing behaviors that fall within the expected range of a child's age and stage of development. That is why the correct answer here is C, similar frequency and intensity as other children of the same mental age. This means that children exhibit developmentally appropriate oppositional behavior aren't considerably more frequent or intense in their oppositional tendency compared to their peers of similar mental age. It's all about being on par with with what's typical for their developmental age. Now let's dissect the other options a bit. Option A suggests that the intensity of the oppositional behavior in these children is considerably greater than other children. However, this is quite accurate. While oppositional behavior might be present, it shouldn't be overwhelmingly intense. And then option B implies that the frequency of oppositional behavior is considerably greater. But again, this isn't the case. Developmentally appropriate oppositional behavior shouldn't occur significantly more often than it does in other children of the same mental age. And then finally, option D, that suggests that the intensity of the oppositional behavior is significantly lesser compared to other children. However, this is a bit too extreme. The idea that it's not considerably more intense, but it's also not significantly less intense. We're aiming for a balance here, which is why option C hits the mark. Question 12. According to the DSM-5, which disorder should not be diagnosed concurrently with oppositional defined disorder? A, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, B, adjustment disorder, C, conduct disorder, or D, schizophrenia? The correct answer is A, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. According to the DSM-5, when we're assessing a child for oppositional defiant disorder, it's crucial to consider if they also exhibit symptoms of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. 
If they do, then diagnose an ODD in isolation wouldn't be appropriate. This is because disruptive mood dysregulation disorder involves severe recurrent temper outbursts that are out of proportion to the situation and inconsistent with the developmental level. So these temper outbursts can mask or overlap with the oppositional behavior, making it a challenge to differentiate between the two disorders. Now let's address the other options. Option B, adjustment disorder is typically not a disorder that conflicts with the diagnosing of oppositional defined disorder. Adjustment disorder is diagnosed when a person's emotional or behavioral responses to a stressor are excessive or maladaptive. Option C, conduct disorder and schizophrenia. If option D, they're also not disorders that are directly conflict with the diagnosis of ODD. However, it's worth noting that oppositional behaviors can sometimes co-occur with these disorders, complicating the diagnostic process. But the critical point here is that disruptive mood dysregulation disorder shouldn't be diagnosed concurrently with ODD. Question 13. When should oppositional defiant behavior be diagnosed as an adjustment disorder? Is it A, when it's a reaction to a stressor? B, when it lasts for more than six months? C, when it's observed in a child with ADHD? Or D, when it's accompanied by conduct disorder symptoms? The correct answer here is A, when it's a reaction to a stressor. Now, when we're considering the diagnosis of adjustment disorder, it's essential to recognize that this disorder involves emotional or behavioral symptoms that develop in response to an identifiable stressor. These symptoms must occur within three months of onset of the stressor and should not be out of proportion to what would typically be expected in response to the stressor. So if a child's oppositional behavior arises as a direct reaction to a specific stressor, such as a family upheaval or a significant life change, it may be more fitting to diagnose adjustment disorder rather than ODD. So let's go over the other options. Option B suggests that adjustment disorder should be diagnosed when oppositional behavior lasts for more than six months. Uh, That's not accurate. Adjustment disorder is more about the timing of the behavior in response to the stressor rather than its duration. Then option C brings up the idea that diagnosing adjustment disorder when oppositional behavior is observed in a child with ADHD. While it's true that children with ADHD may experience adjustment disorder in addition to their primary diagnosis, the presence of ADHD alone wouldn't automatically warrant a diagnosis of an adjustment disorder. And then option D, mentioning diagnosing adjustment disorder when oppositional behavior is accompanied by conduct symptoms. Again, while conduct disorder symptoms might co-occur with an adjustment disorder. It's the specific relationship between the behavior and an identifiable stressor that distinguishes adjustment disorder from ODD. So option A remains the most accurate choice. Question 14. Oppositional and negativistic behaviors can also be present in A, depression and anxiety disorders, B, schizophrenia and bipolar disorders, C, ADHD and cognitive disorders, or D, autism spectrum disorders and obsessive compulsive disorders. The correct answer is C, ADHD and cognitive disorders. Now, oppositional and negativistic behaviors aren't exclusive to oppositional defined disorder. They can manifest in other conditions. ADHD and cognitive disorders are among those conditions. Children with ADHD may exhibit oppositional behaviors due to difficulties with impulse control and attention regulation. Similarly, cognitive disorder can affect a child's understanding of social cues and norms leading to oppositional behaviors as well. And option A, depression and anxiety disorders, while they can certainly influence behavior, they aren't typically associated with the oppositional behavior described. 
Depression might manifest as the irritability or moodiness, but it's not synonymous with oppositional behavior. And then option B, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Well, that involves more severe disturbances in mood and thought and perception, and oppositional behavior might not be the primary concern in these disorders. And option D, autism spectrum disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. It can indeed involve repetitive or ritualistic behaviors, but these behaviors might not always align with the definition of oppositional behavior. Question 15. Which disorder may be considered a natural progression of oppositional defiant behavior in some cases? A. ADHD, B. Conduct disorder, C. Anxiety disorder, or D. Assessive compulsive disorder? The correct answer is B. Conduct disorder. Oppositional defiant behavior may progress to a more severe disorder known as conduct disorder. Conduct disorder involves a pattern of behavior where the basic rights of others or major age-appropriate societal norms or rules are violated. It's often seen as a more severe form of disruptive behavior compared to oppositional defiant disorder. Question 16. Many children who have ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder develop conduct disorder by what age? A, 5 years, B, 10 years, C, 12 years of age, or D, 16 years old? The correct answer is C, 12 years of age. Many children who have both ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder may develop conduct disorder before the age of 12. This highlights a critical developmental period during the progression from ODD to conduct disorder that may occur. Question 17. According to the current census, how many subtypes of oppositional defiant disorder may exist? Is it A, 1, B, 2, C, 3, or D, 4 types? The correct answer is B, 2. There are two subtypes of oppositional defiant disorder. One subtype is more likely to progress to conduct disorder characterized by aggression and antisocial traits, such type, and the vindictive type. The other subtype is characterized by less aggression and fewer antisocial traits, and it's less likely to progress to conduct disorder. Question 18. Which subtype of oppositional defiant disorder is characterized by less aggression and fewer antisocial traits? A. Vindictive type, B. Angry irritable type, C. Passive type, and D. The non-compliant type. The correct answer is B. The angry irritable type. Question 19. Which of the following is not a factor influencing the diagnosis of ODD concurrently with ADHD? A, the severity, B, the duration, C, pervasiveness, or D, gender? The correct answer is D, gender. Factors that influence the diagnosis of ODD with ADHD emphasizes the importance of considering the severity, pervasiveness, and duration of oppositional behavior. However, gender is not mentioned as one of these factors. Question 20, what percentage of children with ODD may not meet the diagnosis several years later? A, up to one-fourth, B, up to one-half, C, up to three-fourths, or D, up to one-third? The correct answer is up to one-fourth. So children with oppositional defined disorder may not meet the diagnosis several years later. This suggests that a significant portion of children diagnosed with ODD may no longer meet the diagnostic criteria after some time has passed. Question 21. What is the primary treatment approach for ODD? Is it A, individual psychotherapy, B, pharmacotherapy, C, family intervention, or D, cognitive behavioral therapy? The correct answer is C, family intervention. 
Option A is incorrect, individual psychotherapy. You know, it may be a part of the treatment plan for the child with ODD, but it typically isn't the primary approach. You know, while individual therapy can be beneficial for helping children develop adaptive responses and improve their social interaction, it's not the foremost strategy. And then option B, pharmacotherapy, using meds. Uh, That can be done sometimes with adjunctive treatment for ODD, especially if the patient has comorbid conditions like ADHD or anxiety. However, medication alone is not considered the primary treatment for ODD. And then D, cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, it's, indeed, it's a valuable therapeutic approach for various mental conditions, including ODD. However, The primary treatment for ODD cannot solely be cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, CBT, it does teach parents how to alter their behavior and diminish attention to oppositional behavior. They are, it can be integrated with family interventions, but not used alone. So family intervention is the primary choice for treatment. Question 22, in individual psychotherapy for ODD, what is one of the primary strategies commonly used to help children develop more adaptive responses? A, medication management. B, role playing and practicing adaptive responses. C, encouraging aggressive behavior. Or D, diminishing attention to undesired behavior. The correct answer is B, role playing and practicing adaptive responses. So why is that? Well, Role-playing and practicing adaptive responses provide a structured and interactive approach to teaching children with ODD new coping strategies and social skills. By engaging in hands-on learning experiences within a supportive therapeutic environment, children can acquire the tools they need to navigate interpersonal challenges more effectively and improve their overall quality of life. Let's explore why the other options are not the private strategy. Option A, medication management. Using medications to manage symptoms of mental health conditions can be part of the treatment plan with children with ODD, but individual psychotherapy typically focus on behavioral and cognitive interventions rather than medication management. Option C, encouraging aggressive behavior, goes completely against the therapeutic goals set forth for the child with ADD. And then option D, diminish attention to undesired behavior. It is indeed a strategy that's commonly used in behavioral intervention, but it's not the primary focus of individual psychotherapy. While reducing attention to undesired behavior can be part of a comprehensive treatment plan, individual psychotherapy often involves more direct interventions such as role-playing and practicing adaptive responses. Question 23. What type of parenting style may evoke the emergence of aggression in children with ODD? A, positive reinforcement. B, harsh punishment and verbal punishment. C, selective reinforcement. Or D, role-playing and practicing adaptive responses. The correct answer is B, harsh physical and verbal punishment. I feel A and D are obvious, so I'll just say option C, selective reinforcement. You know, that refers to reinforcing specific behaviors while ignoring others. While inconsistent reinforcement strategies may contribute to behavioral issues, they are not as directly associated with evoking aggression or harsh punishment. Question 24. What is one aspect that must be addressed before children with ODD can make more positive responses to external control? A, encouraging aggressive behavior, B, reinforcing harsh punishment, C, restoring self-esteem, D, diminishing attention to pro-social behaviors. The correct answer is C, restoring self-esteem. So when we address self-esteem issues, it's essential for children with ODD to develop a positive self-image, engage in more adaptive behaviors, and respond positively to external control measures. Restoring self-esteem creates a foundation upon which other therapeutic interventions can build, fostering healthier relationships, and promoting positive outcomes in the management of ODD. The incorrect answers, option A, encouraging aggressive behavior, that's counterproductive to the treatment of ODD. You know, the goal of therapy is to reduce aggression and oppositional behaviors, not encourage it. And then option B, reinforce harsh punishment, again, completely contrary to 
principles that are effective in the treatment of ODD. Reinforced and harsh punishment can exacerbate negative behaviors and harm the therapeutic relationship between the child and the caregiver. And then option D, diminishing attention to pro-social behaviors. That goes against the therapeutic goal of reinforcing positive behaviors. Ignoring pro-social behaviors can undermine efforts to promote adaptive behaviors and improve the child's social interaction. Question 25. At what age can oppositional defined disorder typically begin? A, one year, B, five years, C, eight years of age, or D, 12 years of age? The correct answer is C, eight years of age. Oppositional defined disorder typically emerges around this time, although it can start at three years of age, but not typical. Question 26. What percentage of school-age children exhibit negativistic traits in non-clinical populations? A, 5 to 10%, B, 16 to 22%, C, 30 to 40%, or D, 50 to 60%. The correct answer here is B, 16 to 22%. Epidemiological studies have found that a significant portion of school-age children, specifically around 16 to 22%, exhibit negativistic traits in non-clinical populations. Question 27. What is the typical sex ratio for ODD before puberty? A, equal, B, higher in boys, C, higher in girls, D, not specified. The correct answer here is B, higher in boys. Before puberty, oppositional defined disorder tends to be more prevalent in boys compared to girls. Question 28. What percentage of school-age boys may exhibit ODD behavior before puberty? A, 2 to 5 percent, B, 8 to 10 percent, C, 12 to 16 percent, or D, 20 to 25 percent? The correct answer here is C, 12 to 16 percent. Before puberty, it's reported that a percentage of school-age boys may exhibit oppositional defiant disorder behavior within the range of 12 to 16 percent. Question 29. When does the prevalence of ODD behavior start to diminish in youth? A, before six years of age, B, after eight years of age, C, after 12 years of age, or D, after 16 years of age? The correct answer is after 12 years of age. The prevalence of oppositional defiant behavior typically starts to diminish in youth after the age of 12. Question 30. Pathological oppositional defiant disorder is characterized by A. Abnormally persistent developmental phases B. Authority figures underreacting to oppositional behavior C. Oppositional behavior occurring less frequently than usual or D. Recurrent oppositional behavior exceeding typical patterns the correct answer is D, recurrent oppositional behavior exceeding typical patterns. You see, in ODD, it's not just about a toddler throwing a temper tantrum here or there or testing boundary. It's when the behavior becomes consistent and over the top thing happening more frequently and intensely than you'd expect for their age. This persistence is a hallmark of the disorder. Now, why are the others incorrect? Option A, that mentions abnormally persistent developmental phases, but that's not quite hitting the nail on the head. We're not so much concerned with the developmental phases themselves as we are with the behavior that persists beyond them. And option B, that talks about authority figures underreacting, but in ODD, it's more about the kids overreacting and pushing back against authority. So underreacting wouldn't typically lead to a diagnosis of ODD. And then option C, that suggests that oppositional behavior occurring less frequently than usual. But remember, in ODD, we're looking for the opposite, behavior that's more frequent and intense than typical. So in the nutshell, it's all about that recurrent, exaggerated oppositional behavior that goes beyond what is considered normal for their age. Question 31. Which element of oppositional defiant disorder is considered most predictive of later psychiatric disorders? A. Assertiveness. B. Temperamental predisposition. C. Irritability. Or D. Stability of preferences. 
The correct answer is C, irritability. Studies have shown consistently that irritability in children with ODD tends to be strongly associated with the development of later psychiatric disorders. It's like a warning sign indicating potential future mental health challenges. Question 32. Parents who model extreme ways of expressing and enforcing their own will may contribute to the development of chronic struggles with their children, which children then reenact with what? A, their peers, B, their siblings, C, authority figures, or D, teachers? The correct answer is C, authority figures. Now, why is it authority figures specifically? Well, when parents demonstrate extreme ways of exerting their will, it sets a precedent for how children interact not only with their parents, but also with other authority figures in their lives, like teachers, coaches, and even law enforcement as they grow older. Now let's go over the incorrect options. Option A mentions peers, but while peer relationships certainly influence a child's behavior, they're not the primary focus here. We're more concerned with how parental modeling affects the child's interactions with authority figures. And option B brings up siblings, which can influence a child's behavior. But again, the main emphasis here is on the modeling provided by parents and how it impacts the interactions with authority figures. And then option D talks about teachers, which is closer to the mark, but it's a bit too narrow in scope. We're looking at a broader range of authority figures beyond just teachers. Question 33. According to the classic psychoanalytic theory, Defiant behavior targeting authority figures are fueled by what? A, learned behavior from peers, B, reinforcement from authority figures, C, unresolved conflicts, D, genetic predisposition. The correct answer here is C, unresolved conflicts. But why? According to classic psychoanalytic theory, oppositional behavior towards authority figures stem from deep-seated conflicts with the individual. These conflicts might originate from past experiences or unresolved issues in early childhood, which manifest as defiance to authorities. So let's go over the incorrect ones. Option A mentions learned behavior from peers, but classic psychoanalytic therapy focuses more on internal conflicts rather than external influences like peer behavior. Option B, that brings up the reinforcement from authority figures. But again, classic psychoanalytic therapy tends to emphasize internal psychological processes rather than the external reinforcement mechanisms. And then option D, genetic predispositions, uh, which while relevant to understand behavior, it isn't the primary focus of classic psychoanalytic therapy theory, which tends to dwell into the unconscious mind and early experiences as the root of behavior. Alrighty, all done. Go ahead and click on one of these other videos on conduct disorder or intermittent explosive disorder to learn about other behavioral issues with children. Thanks. Have a good day.